Idiosyncrasies, the idiomatic things that are weird. Welcome to the Emacs speedrun. This video is for programmers who are comfortable with configuration but are about to dive into deeper customization and extension with Elisp. We're going to cover things that are common, likely different than what you expect, and likely not what you're thinking about searching for when you encounter them. Emacs Lisp is a Lisp2, and this means that the same symbol can have a value as a variable and can be called as a function. The variable and the function are independent. They can show up even in the same expression. So the same name, the same symbol, can both be a function and it can be bound to a variable at the same time. The first time you will encounter this is likely with minor mode. By convention, when you read the name of the minor mode as a variable, that represents whether it's enabled or not. And if you call it as a function, that's going to toggle the mode. And basically, in every minor mode's function body that's enabling the mode, it will check the value of that variable to decide, should I enable the mode or should I clean up the state? Another case is this transient list variable. That symbol as a variable represents the class for a transient list variable. And as a function, it will create a new object of the class. Buffer local variables. So you need to have a value that's independent for each buffer. Without buffer locals, Packages that need independent states for different buffers would be having to keep track of all of the states for all of the buffers and then passing in the buffer name to get the right value. But because buffer locals are first class, when we want the buffer local value, we can just read the symbol. By default, it's going to get the buffer local value. Here's a small example that will set a variable locally, but then we'll try to read that in the context of another buffer. And it's going to fail because that variable is not defined there. There are a lot of buffer local variables in use. Basically, anytime you have a package that has independent states per buffer, it's going to store them in buffer local variables. Directory locals allow setting local variables in every file in a directory. When you open a file in that directory, you get those local variables set. And file local variables are usually declared in a comment at the end of a file or in a special header such as like lexical binding that you see in elisp files all the time. There are two basic schemes for using buffer locals. If you want a variable to be local every single time it's used, use defvar local. If instead you want to start with a global variable and then make that variable local on demand, use defvar and then use setQLocal to make it local in buffers that need their own value. There are local specific functions like setQLocal and buffer local value, and then there are global specific functions like setQDefault and default value. Moving on to keyword symbols, these are found in a lot of calls to things like text properties and certain functions that take a lot of arguments. Because they are syntax highlighted, you may be wondering, is there something going on here? Not really. So if I have a symbol starting with a colon and I quote it, it's the same symbol. But it is not the same as the symbol without the colon. Keyword symbols are optionally quoted. That's it. You will encounter plists that use regular symbols or keyword symbols. They don't behave any differently and the calls to look up the values are identical. One other place that these keyword symbols show up is when you're defining a function using cldefun. cldefun can, among other things, define functions that accept keyword arguments, and so you can pass in named arguments, and you do that with keyword symbols. Symbols can have more metadata attached to them. This is the symbol plist. You will run into situations where you can't find the data in the variable. It's not the function. It's got to be somewhere. It's probably in the symbol plist. This is similar to the dict attribute in Python. And these plists are used to implement things like checking if a function is interactive only, looking for ERT test definitions, and EIEIO objects and classes. If we take a look at the symbol plist for Magit Dispatch, we will see that there is some metadata there. And if we open this same symbol up in Helpful Function and we look down at Symbol Properties, that is the symbol plist. So when you're checking out variables and functions, be sure to look at the symbol plist. You may see some hints about what's going on. And finally, if we just run Magit Dispatch, we can see some of this metadata in action. This transient user interface is stored inside of the symbol plist for Magit Dispatch. Setf. This is a macro that is not super unique to Emacs Lisp, but certain Emacs Lisp types have their interface built around using it. You will encounter the use case for setf whenever you find a type that has a getter, but there is no apparent setter. Decoded time is one such example. I have functions like decoded time year to get the year from a decoded time list, but I don't have any decoded time set year function. 
Now, what often happens is someone will look at the return value of decode time and they see that it's just a list and they think, okay, I'll, I'll munge this list. And so they might do something like, I'll get the fifth cutter and then I'll set the car of that cutter to 1999 and that'll update the year. And when you're reading this, it just doesn't mean anything. So let's look at the right way to do this. I have found my function for decoded time year, so I'm gonna get the year, that's my getter. If I call setf with that get value, then it will set it to 2026. So when you're reading this code, you can actually tell what it means. For an even better example, we're going to look at overlays. Overlays are intrinsics, they are defined in C. We can't just modify a list by hand, so there isn't even a dirty way to do it. There are functions for overlay start and overlay end to read those values, but there is no setter, so if you don't use setf, then there's no way to do it. To see this in action, we will create an overlay, and it is going to start and end where my cursor is, and then I'm going to add a property to set the colors for that overlay, and then finally I'm going to call this setf, to update the end, the overlay end, to the current point. So that's going to expand the overlay from between where I defined it and where my cursor is now. Advising functions. This is basically analogous to the decorator pattern in C++ or using decorators in Python. The most unique thing about advice is that you can operate on the return values or the arguments. You don't have to handle everything. So you're not just wrapping the entire function. There's quite a few ways for adding advice to a function. The short example here will add advice to the test fund function in the filter return position that will make every return value odd. And so instead of returning six, the function returns seven now. There are a lot of use cases for advice. If you were doing some kind of debugging or profiling and you needed to modify a lot of functions dynamically, advice would be one way. One of the most common use cases by users is if you need something to happen at the same time as something else, normally there should be hooks that are exposed for that and you would just add the function to a hook. But if there is no hook, then you can find something that's called every time you need to run your function and then just advise that function to the function that runs at the right time. A tricky case that you might use advice is if you need to temporarily modify the behavior of a function. So you would add the advice, do whatever is going to call the function, and then remove the advice. The general recommendation around advice is that if there is a better way to do something, such as using a hook, then it's not recommended. And that's especially true for intrinsic functions, which are not guaranteed to run advices. Using let binding to temporarily override settings. You will run into situations where, in order to change the behavior of a function, you have to change some of the user options. It would be rude to change the value for the entire session, and you also want to handle the cleanup implicitly. The idiomatic way to do this is shown in the example where we use a let binding to set load prefer newer to true. Coming over from many other languages with lexical scoping everywhere, you will be thinking, if I set this in my local scope, why would it affect what happens during the function call? We have encountered another nuanced design choice. Variables defined with defvar, defcustom, and defconst are dynamically scoped. In Emacs Lisp, they call these special variables, and you'll see lots of references to them in the manual. The most common way that they are used is by let binding them to temporarily set them. To demonstrate a really common case, we're going to look at case sensitivity. There's a variable called casefoldsearch. It does what it sounds like. It folds up all of the cases so that they're all the same. So if you set it to nil, you get case sensitive search. If you set it to T, you get case insensitive search. Going with the theme of cleaning up temporary states, we're gonna look at save excursion. Let's say you're writing a command and you realize that you need to query the text around the point. You need to look at the contents of the buffer in order to figure out what to do. The thing that's a little bit unnatural at first is you'll see functions like backwards s expression and you'll be thinking, I don't wanna use that because it's gonna leave behind dirty state. I don't wanna clean it up. Luckily, there are some macros like save excursion that you just wrap the body in that macro and it will restore the point for you. So for example, we can go back to the beginning of the line and then get the point value and return that in the body of this save excursion and it will restore the point. So we don't see the point move, we just get the value we were looking for. 
And there's a couple of these, like if you need to widen the buffer or narrow the buffer to a certain section, you can use save restriction. And if you need to search around using reg expressions, but you don't want to clobber the user's match data, then you can use save match data. Namespaces. There's only one. Once again, this is a nuanced design choice that allows any piece of ELISP code to poke at any other piece of ELISP code without using any kind of magic. You can see and munge everything. By convention, every package uses a prefix for every single variable or function it defines. One of the places this is really valuable is if you need to look for a function that will work on a type or will return a type. And what you can do is go into function completions, start with the type, so if that's window or buffer or string, and you can see all of the functions that will usually return or work on that type. We use double dash names to indicate that a variable is not intended to be kept stable and probably shouldn't be relied upon. It's not exactly private, but don't rely on it staying the same. Buffer passing. So let's say you want to edit a file. You're thinking, I want to open up the file, get some kind of a cursor, and write my edits, and then close the file. You're thinking, I don't need to show this to the user in a window, so why would I need a buffer? Well, in Emacs, the way we do it is we visit the file with a buffer, and then we use all of our great editing commands to change the buffer, and then save that to the file. The effect is that we end up doing all of our file I.O. with buffers, and so it's quite normal to pass around buffers. Another place that this shows up is doing large amounts of edits on a string. String edits would normally require an allocation, whereas the backing data structure for a buffer is a gap buffer. It's a little bit more efficient for that. And don't be afraid of buffers using a lot of extra resources because when you use them this way, they're in fundamental mode and they just they don't have that much extra associated state. The last place this is common is with processes, where a process filter will by default write its output to a buffer. So whenever you're using Magit and it says look at the output of the git buffer, that's one of these process filter output buffers. And for our extra awesome example, we are going to open up a buffer called good buffer name, insert the file contents of this particular org file, and then read the substring from the first 200 characters. And there you had it. We opened a buffer, did some I.O., didn't hurt a bit. Homo iconicity. The nerdy explanation is that working on the source code for the language is the same as working on data structures in the language. The practical explanation is that when we're writing macros that need to generate code, we use the same tools for editing and modifying lists to generate our output expressions. If you squint your eyes, every defun is a list. So where you're seeing this all the time is that the value that you're writing in source code has the same representation after it's evaluated. And this kind of means serialization for free. I just take the representation of state and that is also the valid language expression. The only place this doesn't work is that some of the intrinsics like buffers and overlays, they don't have any valid read representation. It wouldn't make sense to rehydrate those things. And so they have a hash in front of the object and you cannot write them or read them. Another place this shows up is that when an ELIS package needs to save some data or some settings to disk, instead of using TOML or JSON and then rehydrating it and going through all this work to convert it back into ELIS state, you just take the state that you want, write those expressions to a file, and then read them from the file. ELISP in, ELISP out, no serialization. For our example code, all we have to do is set a file name, create a data structure, and usually you're going to splice that data together, stitching it together using quasi-quoting just like writing macros, and then I can print it into a buffer, write the buffer to file, and then read the file into a new buffer, read that buffer, and there's my data structure. Round trip, all ELISP. If the state that you need to generate would be more easily expressed using some functions and macros, then you can write those into the file and then just run eval. So saving a generated program to disk and then running it on demand. Commands and functions. The most intriguing duality since the advent of code. This is one of those Emacs specific things and it's basically about getting arguments into functions when those functions are being called through key sequences. In order to obtain these arguments, we add an interactive form to the function that describes how to go get the arguments. Functions that have these interactive forms are commands and can be bound to key sequences. The thing that feels a little bit weird is that the interactive form is after the argument list and it feels like we're violating causality. 
The answer is that the macros are working together to make sure we don't go back in time. That interactive form is effectively only called before the function when it's called interactively. The other weirdness is that there's two ways to call this thing. We can call it directly as a function by passing in some arguments, or we can bind it as a key, enter the key sequence, and it will ask us for the arguments using that interactive form that we specified. The 2.5th way to do it is via call interactively. So let's say you find a command, you want to call this command inside your function, and you run the command, but you get slightly different behavior. It probably is checking whether it's run interactively or not, and when you run it interactively, it will give you different behavior. So if you want to get the same behavior as when you call a function via a key sequence, use this call interactively. Iteration in Elisp. If you have used list comprehensions in Python and pattern matching in Rust, you may be looking for a refund. We can check out how to get some value out of the built-ins later, but basically what's going on is if you really need some heavy-duty Lisp transformation and Lisp comprehensions, the CLlib package is there and it has the CL loop macro. So that's why it seems like the iterators in Elisp are a little bit vanilla. The only downside is that really powerful macros are typically like using a domain-specific language, and CL loop is no exception. But if you feel like you can understand what's going on and you want to add really heavy-duty list transformations into your toolbox, then go ahead and check it out. This example below was 100% generated in an LLM. Don't be afraid to try it. If you think you have encountered any idiosyncrasies on your own that belong in this content, comment below. If you're one of our GitHub sponsors, don't forget to check out our YouTube repository where we have toy packages and literate org files and all of the slides. Becoming a sponsor starts at a dollar a month, and if you just want to support the channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. For the next video, we're going to take a look at org tree slide. We're going to do some deep customization and extension, making changes to the package itself, and that'll show up in the lunch playlist. For the speedrun playlist, I think the next video is probably going to be about discovery and efficiently finding functions and picking apart what's going on. It's done!